Okay, uh, th thank you. So I'm currently uh, working as Professor of Cybersecurity at Birmingham City University, and, and I'm uh, involved in uh, a number of the working groups of the IoT Security Foundation. Uh, so what I'm going to be telling you about uh, today is a, a personal perspective arising from uh, one of those um, uh, line, lines of work in, uh, in one of those working groups. Um, Okay, so I think we'd all recognize that, uh, that there's a lot of interest, a lot of demand for uh, IoT and the benefits that it can offer, and a growing awareness that uh, security is, a, is an issue to be concerned about. Um, but end users and uh, IoT product developers uh, tend to ask simple, straightforward questions like, is this device or system secure? Or in the case of a developer, how do I make the uh, device or system secure? So the questioner wants a simple, prescriptive, objective answer to this deceptively simple question. However, as we know, security is complex, con context dependent, and uh, subjective. So how do we resolve that uh, conflict? Let let's consider a typical IoT uh, product, and I'll be referring to that product as the target of evaluation, or TOE, uh, in, in these slides. So the manufacturer or supplier of the, of the product knows a lot about the product anyway, maybe not all, but a lot about it. And he wants to know, is the product security enough for its intended market? Is it fit for purpose from a security point of view? <coughs> Uh, and also um, would like to know some limitations on secure usage to, to pass that on to, to the customers. I doesn't have a particularly strong idea of the usage environment unless the functionality of the, the, the product is very, very specific. On the other hand, uh, the end user or the customer uh, has a pretty good idea of where, for what, and how the product uh, will be used, or at least what he intends when, uh, when it's bought. I want to know which amongst several product offerings to buy, uh, and also how to use the, uh, the product securely. It doesn't know much about the internal details of the, of the product. And neither of them typically will know a great deal about security. So, the... Um, the centerpiece of the IoT Security Foundation's work in uh, trying to answer those questions for those stakeholders is the compliance framework. So, and this is, um, and this will, if applied correctly, uh, will tell the developer what controls the product requires and the user what characteristics to look for in a product to, um, to, to procure. Uh, it's recognized that uh, one, a one-size-fits-all approach to security doesn't fly. So uh, IOTSF has introduced this concept of the compliance class, uh, which is a means of characterizing um, products or um, usage requirements, uh, whereby compliance class zero corresponds to a basic level of security, and we're seeing increasingly a consensus about what that basic hygiene factor in IoT uh, ought to be. Um, but rising from that compliance class zero, uh, we have uh, four additional higher classes uh, expressing the degree of security required. And it is the, um, the, the work that I'm uh, involved in that I'm talking about today is essentially to provide uh, actionable advice, actionable accessible advice for these classes of stakeholder in determining that compliance class. So to, um, we need to uh, place that uh, compliance framework and compliance class in the context of security risk management which is about balancing risk exposure against risk appetite. Uh, so risk appetite uh, is basically a measure of the, the tolerance of a system owner for risk. 
uh, and clearly is a subjective uh, attribute. Uh, risk exposure, on the other hand, uh, is more objective and depends on the potential consequences of a, uh, of a compromise of the target of evaluation. Uh, the degree to which the target of evaluation is exposed to threat agents and the nature of those agents, uh, and the vulnerability of the, of the TOE itself. The risk of oversimplification, I would say that we can think of the vulnerability as being a property of the target of evaluation, whereas the other properties are to do with the environment in which it's going to be used. And at least in theory, uh, if we choose the, the right compliance class for the product or, or usage, uh, and the TOE satisfies the compliance framework, then risk exposure and risk appetite should be in balance. So just a reminder of the, uh, the standard um, information security risk uh, management process. Um, this is the, the, the version from ISO 27005. Just include it to remind people that it is an iterative process uh, of which the core activities are context establishment, risk assessment, and then risk treatment. Um, so how do we then fit that IOTSF compliance class and compliance framework view into this risk management process? Well. Uh, initially, um, we, we do uh, context establishment, and this is essentially the same as in the ISO 27005 process. But in particular, we gather information on the, on the usage and threat environment. In the determined compliance class uh, step, we have to um, perform uh, the risk enumeration uh, and for each of those, each of those risks that uh, we want to consider, uh, we have to combine the um, combine the, uh, the the threat and uh, impact assessment, and then aggregate all those uh, all those quantities um, to get a single uh, um, compliance class uh, score. Uh, effectively, so it's a single, a single number, a single rating uh, that has to aggregate quite a lot of information there. Uh, and we can think of the uh, compliance class then as a sort of measure of the security deficit uh, that has to be made up by applying the controls um, demanded by the compliance framework. So. Uh, after applying the compliance framework, uh, then uh, we should have a reasonably good uh, stab at, uh, at a system uh, in which um, uh, risk appetite and risk exposure are balanced. But even in the case of the lower compliance classes, compliance class zero even, uh, it's still important to do, at the very least, a sanity check to see whether, indeed, those two quantities are in balance. Uh, and if they're not, uh, revisit the process, maybe adjust the compliance class, etc. And also, it, uh, it's important to allow for the possibility that um, that assessment of residual risk might indicate that this process is not converging on something um, sensible and that a full risk assessment uh, may be required. And, and it may be required in, in, in any case. So I've introduced the compliance class as a measure of the amount of security required. Um, but it also has uh, some other um, uses within the, um, within the uh, IoT uh, system, IoT Security Foundation system. And uh, so the second one um, shown there is that it's an indicator of the degree of rigor um, to be applied as part of the compliance process. So for compliance class zero, a simple uh, self-assessment and self-certification, um, if you like, 
um, may, may be all that's required. Uh, at intermediate classes, there may be a requirement for completing paperwork and sitting, sub, um, submitting it to an independent accredited assessor. Uh, and for the highest classes, it may be necessary to submit the product to a test lab for a uh, more formal evaluation. Um, but in the course of this work, I think I've uncovered a, a, a third uh, usage, and that is as an indicator of the rigor of the risk assessment that's required. Um, so as I indicated for compliance class zero, uh, a simple consistency check, a uh, sanity check may be all that's, that's required. Um, but I think uh, would normally be the case that for the higher compliance class, classes, a, a full risk assessment will be required and that effectively dominates the compliance framework. Uh, with the compliance framework being a convenient shortcut to get the system, the, the controls incorporated um, reasonably close to those eventually required. Um, but also, it may be the case that the product doesn't fit neatly into, the, uh, into any of the, um, uh, of the compliance classes, uh, in which case, again, the default should be to a uh, full uh, risk assessment. So just to, um, to, to summarize and conclude, um, so I just want to say that, uh, that the compliance class determination actually incorporates quite a lot of, uh, quite a lot of um, you know, insightful uh, uh, risk assessment related processes. It's certainly not trivial even for low classes. So there's still a gap between you know, what uh, an end user or a developer needs to do uh, in terms of risk assessment uh, and what they are actually equipped to carry out. So I think I mean, that's an important part of our role in the ITSF to try and bring those, to try and close that gap. And I think it'd be wrong to, to think that we can absolve um, end users of, of all responsibility for <coughs> risk. They need to uh, perform that um, assessment themselves and be risk aware uh, and take on, uh, take on risk with uh, an appropriate level of understanding. However, we in the IoT Security Foundation and, pro and developers, etc., uh, must do their bit, um, partly in uh, raising awareness and educating end users and developers in the principle of risk management, but also providing the relevant and actionable um, information so that they can perform the risk assessment in their own terms and you know, enter into IoT sales and usage uh, in, um, in full knowledge of the, um, of, of the, of the risks uh, required. Uh, so that was uh, all I had planned to say. <laughs>